Welcome to a new season of The Profile. We are ready to go. Where your milestones will be x-rayed and revisited. Yes. Your experiences growing up academics, social and community development landmarks and challenges will be scanned. The, 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 the Profile, where leadership believe in both the private and public sector will be looked into without the optics of partisan politics. The Profile. 22 minutes past 10 a.m. this beautiful Saturday morning, and you're locked on to the Dial of Champions 92.3 Search FM, reaching you from the MBB House on the Gidankwando campus of the Federal University of Technology. Now, my name is Odaba Koji, and you're welcome uh, to the show this morning. Now, uh, this is the profile. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a guest with us here today, uh, but it's really exciting today to be able to uh, listen to someone who has a wealth of experience who'd be willing to share with us here this morning uh, so that we can all learn from him, uh, listen with his ears, and uh, look at the world through the lens of his eyes and his experience. I'll just do a brief run-through of his profile. With me this morning at the MBB house is Comrade Labarang uh, You know, he will be telling his story, uh, but I'll just do a brief run through. Uh, he was born in uh, on the 15th of December. Uh, he is from Chanchaga local government right here in Niger State. Uh, far back in 1978, he got his first school leaving certificate from Makama Primary School, Mina. And then he proceeded to the government teachers college, La Pai, where he got his grade two teacher certificate, uh, following which he got uh, a, a deep Diploma from the College of Education, MENA, in public administrations. Moved on to get a bachelor in education degree from uh, the Amadou Bello University and then an MTech from the prestigious Federal University of Technology, MENA. Over the years, he's gone through different spaces as a class teacher, an assistant headmaster, then a headmaster, and as a career trade unionist. Uh, I'd just like to welcome you uh, once again to the profile. Uh, Welcome, Comrade Labarangarba. Good morning. Uh, so um, let's just get right into it. Uh, let's talk about your childhood. Let's talk about growing up and, you know, primary school. How did that go uh, way back then? Well, um, once again, good morning, listeners. Uh, it's interesting to have a flashback from the childhood uh, uh, stage in life. Uh, I grew up from... A family that I will describe as an uh, uh, average well-to-do family. And um, I had the privilege of being brought up in a very disciplined home where whatever we do at that time is under the guidance of parents and other elders. So from there, I think um, one has the privilege of going through the public primary schools where I started my uh, Western education career from the uh, started from uh, Central Primary School before eventually I moved to Makama Primary School, where I completed my primary seven uh, uh, program. Then, and uh, all this has been well because um, during my childhood uh, life, I happened to be always with my old father, who has been guiding me on vacation. You know. We used to carry out spares of motorbike, and that's how I grew up. I wasn't having that privilege of joining other groups that are doing nothing from morning till evening. I'll be in the workshop doing one or two things. So that kind of discipline honestly has guided us very squarely in trying to, I mean, in coming up and being what we are today. Uh, there, you know, education was not as costly as it is today. Everything was being provided in the primary schools. The education is free. We'll be giving some uh, 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 structural materials, textbooks, uh, exercise books, pencil, barrel. In fact, even at the time, the school will provide you with some uh, make packages and what have you. Then um, the teachers were so committed. Uh, at a time when you don't go to school, the teacher will trace you back home and uh, ask the parent, we have not seen so so person in the school. What's happened? You see, all these are lost traditions and culture we have we don't have today in our public uh, uh, schools. The teachers, in fact, handle you more better even than the parent at home because they are so caring, they are concerned in trying to be and trying to see what you become uh, in future tomorrow. Uh, that's how we grew up, and from there, I eventually found out myself to uh, uh, secondary school, that is the teacher's training college. In fact, before then, 
uh, before you uh, before you sit for the common entrance examination, there's kind of up to test they have to do for all puppies to know where you can fit in. Is it teachers' college? Is it commercial school? Is it uh, secondary school? In fact, there is a kind of up to two test for placement of where they feel. Then you you perform better, and eventually, I was screened to fall under uh, government teachers training college. Then, and that is how I began my teaching uh, 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 career. Then, uh, I mean, my teaching uh, training college. So I had a kind of uh, differentiation of training. During the training at that uh, teacher's training college, we have uh, two training teaching practice, I call it then. We have the first teaching practice, where you will now go and do what we call observation. You will begin to a school, you will see with the teacher in the classroom, you will be watching how the teacher is teaching. So then that you will start that at uh, when you are in Form 3, then we'll try you move to Form 4, then that's where you're going to have the real teaching practice. You will now be guided under the teacher to see how you can also teach methodology, other techniques of teachings, and what have you. All these rudiments of coaching, we went through them at that time before eventually you will now go and write the teacher's grade two certificate examination. And when you do that, when you by the time you come out, you will now come out as your qualified grade two teacher at that time. So you discover that all these rudiments of training, coaching, guidance, and what have you are. Uh, I won't say I'm completely lacking, but I think almost 70, 80% of this kind of uh, approach is lacking in our public schools today. And that is why in the past, you see a teacher graduating from a secondary school or teacher's training college coming out to teach just like a present graduate in the university because he has been well drilled, he has been well caught. And he has been well taught on different methodologies on how to transmit that kind of knowledge to the younger ones. And I think from there now, I then begin my teaching career as a classroom teacher. And uh, eventually, we keep on teaching, teaching from there. There is this kind of progression in the system. I become assistant headmaster. Uh, from there, headmaster. Then I feel there's every need for one to update his educational knowledge, and that's what made to switch over to uh, College of Education, MENA, where I had my Nigerian Certificate of uh, Education, that is NCE. At the same time, I had to run again for my Diploma in Public Administration. So having completed that, I had to run down to our Amadou Bello University, Zaria, where I had my program in the education, that is BA Education. Came back, I continue with my teaching. From there, I feel it should not end there. I had to now rush back to study education technology, uh, that is MTech in uh, education technology here for my master's in FUT, and uh, life keeps on going. So when while I was doing that, I was not left out in carrying out other youth activities. In fact, from the primary school, I mean secondary school, I've been engaging in one or two different programs like the Red Cross Society, like the Man of War. These are then youth engagement program that keep the youth busy. Uh, before you know, you wouldn't have time for you to be in this group or that group. In fact, during holidays, the then Ministry of Social Development, Youth Sport and Culture used to organize programs for all schools prefects. That is on leadership training. All students prefer to be assembled. Then we'll be there. We, we now listen from the youth officers, do this, don't do that. In fact, at times we used to have what we call adventures. We now, they will now take us out of the town, you know, to drill us on different techniques of, uh, you know, grooming to become a leader then. So I think these are some of the privileges we had during our time. And uh, we, we had the opportunity of became a problem to the societies as youth that time. Because all along, the government were participating, the philanthropics were also supporting in some viable programs that will keep the youth busy. And that's the kind of opportunity we had our time. And uh, today, eventually, we are where we are. Uh, well, that is uh, an absolutely interesting story, first off. And second, it's obvious from the way you're talking that you're a trained teacher. There's the methodology of you going through the entire process. But quick question, 
you said that you had to do before the common entrance there had to be you know an aptitude, aptitude test, test yes. where you pick Yes. Where or no, where you're you're tested on which uh, you know particular institution you end up exactly. in. Exactly. Did you want to be a teacher, or was it just from the aptitude test that that decision was made? Well, right? honestly speaking, is from the aptitude test, and uh, that times people were changing over. You go and see how you can go back to a commercial school or secondary school, but I feel to me right inside me, let me try this aspect of teaching because I love it there. I like seeing somebody, coaching somebody, putting somebody on the right track, on the right foot. I think I develop interest in it. And that was why I pay attention to it. And I came out with flying colors then. Okay. So, um, comrade, let's talk about the transition now from the classroom to trade unionism. How did that happen? Yes. You see, the issue of trade unionism, the way I perceive it, is in one is in one's mind to have the ability to have the interest of struggle for others. So the history of my trade union uh, career started immediately I secure appointment as a classroom teacher. Then I discovered that there is a union that is being registered by government called the Nigerian Union of Teachers at that time. So I feel belonging to that group will, go, will, will, will enable me to at least express myself and ensure that what is due for teachers is given to them by the employers. That is how I began by maybe contesting for the position of first examiner of account at the local government level then. So from there, I'm teaching because the teaching profession qualifies you to be a member. You cannot be a member of AUT then without being a teacher, it's not possible. So that gives me the license and I continue moving on. While I'm teaching, I'm seen participating in my uh, AUT activities. Then eventually I went to the university. Uh, from there, I came back and uh, I continue. While I was in the university, I, I discovered that there was a vacancy at the AUT state level. But before then, at the local government level, I had a, I had a, a contest of uh, being a chairman of NUT Chanchago local government uh, branch, which I won almost two times for eight years. In fact, I started as a caretaker uh, secretary. From there, the teachers feel I should contest. Then from there, I contested and I became the chairman of the branch. I received a contested. I became the prominent of the channel. And that's why I began to gather momentum of uh, trade union leadership. And uh, uh, before you know it, uh, I feel I cannot just continue with that. Let me have a second thing, a second idea. And the second idea is that you must try to reposition yourself properly educationally so that you'll be able to have the instrument and ingredient of being where you are. And that's what motivated me again to move, to study the same program under education, FUT, Masters uh, in uh, Education Technology. And uh, before you know, when I become the secretary of NUT, I say, okay, now I'm here. What do I do? Then I look at the challenges, bedeviling the profession then. Uh, as a secretary, I happen to be the custodian of records, the person that will guide to ensure that the union move in line with the ethics and tradition of its operation as a secretary, and uh, we guide the political officers, and that is how the journey began. So we are moving, we are doing all the needful. Teachers, you know, trade unionism is a kind of challenge. It's a, it's a kind of uh, a, a, a business of uh, serious responsibilities. You know, you do this today with the government look at you as somebody they don't trust, as somebody against them. The teachers, again, also feel that you are their only messiah. You have to go and make sure that what is due for them is gotten from the government. So it's quite interesting. But then you have to make sure that you, you, you assemble certain attributes in you. You cannot be a successful labor leader when you have a kind of attitude of not being upright, attitude of not being sincere 
attitude of going around begging, maybe from your employers, that will certainly lower your level of integrity, your level of respectability, and your level of relevance with the, with the employers. So you need to live within the confinement of what you are getting so that that the employers will continue to have that respect for you and even have respect for the people you are providing that leadership for. Uh, these are some of the kind of privileges we, we've gotten and uh, we're able to apply some of these uh, attributes in our leadership and today we find ourselves uh, where we are. In fact, uh, it may interest listeners to know that uh, in a teaching career, I had almost 12 years in my teaching career and in the career trade unionists, uh, 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 work, I spent almost 28 good years. So when you add 12 plus 28, it gives you 40 years of at least uninterrupted successful service delivery, which I think one has to appreciate God sincerely for doing that. So it's within that range of, uh, of service. From NUT now, the other unions feel that I should come and contest as a chairman of Nigerian Labor Congress, where other affiliates, other unions fall under. So then they don't allow before the advent of uh, Abdul Salam regime, if you're not a card carry member, that is, if you're not in the classroom teaching, that was called card carry member, you will not be allowed to contest. But when Abdul Salam Bakar came at the pre head of state, he said, no, even the non card carry members, we the staff, change the law was changed we can go and contest because we are also uh, uh working within the labor environment within the labor environment so that will give me the license as a no card carry member a career staff of the union i contested for the labor chairman that is in 19 19 uh, 2000 and uh, uh in 1919 i think precisely then i won the first uh, uh election as chairman nlc under the support of other affiliates, the Nigerian uh, uh, Union of Teachers, NOLGE, nurses, and all other unions supported, and I became the chairman. And that is where the real labor uh, uh, exercise began, because you now you now face the challenges at the wide scope, at the wide perspectives. Unlike when you are narrowed and maybe only with teachers, you not deal with other unions. And honestly, it has not been easy. Because here you, you confront the government. We started during the military. Then uh, during the era of Obasanjo, he was the head of, uh, no, sorry, yes, he was the head of, no, no, no. During uh, Abu Salam Abubakar, we, we started also. Then before transition back to the civil rule, already the military were in charge. And, uh, you know, the, the military feel they go, they do their own ruling by edicts, they don't give these democratic processes of doing the rightful things democratically. So we hadn't found it easy. Then Oshomole was our national president. I'm the branch chairman here, the council chairman here. And uh, all that scared ourselves us through is the kind of orientation we received then. Because all we're after, we are soldiers of justice. We ensure that we confront whether you are in uniform or not in uniform. We must make sure we defend what is meant for workers and you must give us. And we don't give a damn. If you say, go and lock them up. We say, okay, that will add to our CV. Because a qualified, real veteran that went through this rigors without being touched, you know, you don't have that gut of saying, yes, I was really a struggle fighter. So... Uh, we had it uh, very successful during the military. Before we now switch over to the civilian rule, already we've been groomed. So when the civilian come, they came with a different approach. Uh, sometimes they feel the workers are not, are not as relevant as the politicians. We have to suit our ground to make them understand that we are the vehicles of implementing their own political programs. So our dues was given to us as a twin due. So I think at the beginning, the move was so rough, and uh, later they realized that, yes, we are good partners to be reckoned with. So we now <clears throat> begin moving, thinking of programs that will put the workers right. And that is how we have been given. But all I'm saying all along is that for you to be a labor leader, 
you must try to be guided by these basic principles of doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, for the right purpose. If you do this, you have no cause to regret. And you see, one thing with leadership is that people feel is there where you can go and make money. No, your integrity matters. And how you end matters. You may not see the money then, but one thing that will keep you going is that wherever you do the needful, you move in the society very freely with pride and you feel that, yes, I have contributed. Certainly, others will appreciate, very many will appreciate, but some will not appreciate. And that is the formula of, you know, how life is. You, wherever you are, wherever, no matter how good you are, you must have the negative ones by your side no matter how excellent you are in performing. But one interesting thing is that no labor leader has ever done his work successfully and regret at the end of the day. But well, I want the public to appreciate that that's what we call societal change. Things changes. The mode of orientation, the mode of training, the mode of leadership style changes. But so long we are alive, we we'll continue to advise and continue to guide and tell our younger ones that do it this way, it will pay you more better than doing it that way. Uh, if the show ends right now, I'm pretty sure that uh, <laughs> the listeners have gotten quite a bit. But just to piggyback off something you said, uh, this is casual. How many times were you locked up? Well, I, you see, one interesting thing is that uh, during the military, we had it rough. Uh, at times, I would be detained from morning to evening. But it's not good enough, like the, the SS says, the police say, come right, sit down there. When it is getting dark, we say, just go back home and relax. Because they knew we are fighting a just cause. That is sure. That is sure. And if it's with the, with the police, we don't normally sleep. I don't have, I've never slept in the cell. Except a day when I had it very tough. Uh, that time, there was an assembly by the military governor then in a very large gathering where he insulted that they have no money to pay the workers. And I outrightly told him, uh, cutting a portion of the Islamic hadiths, that look, a leader who is providing the leadership, by the time people are coming out crying, insulting him, certainly he's being blessed by God is questionable. So the engagement that day was so rough between I and the military uh, uh, governor of that time then I was quietly advised not to sleep in my house. Then there was not this uh, phone, we have to use uh, this uh, uh, mobile, this Turaya of a team to communicate or landline. So I have to communicate to my wife that, look, today I have to sleep somewhere. I told her where I put up in Niger House Motel and uh, under the advice on security that I shouldn't tell anybody where I am. And before you know, it was all over. I think that is almost... Uh, uh, tedious uh, period I found myself and the time also I was stressed down to labor house to see whether I'm here to be beaten up or some or some talks unfortunately I was not there so these are some of the challenges I face but all along it has been a very good story because that uh, it has given me a very good background on remaining standing firm to see that yes I deliver as a labor leader and today I'm happy and I think I'm going to die as a die. I mean, I'm going to die as a happy person because I feel I was able to deliver, and I appreciate God for that. Thank you so much, Comrade Labaran Garba. We'll take a break now. This is the profile on Search Five Nine Two Point Three. Please do us stay with us. We'll take a breather, and we'll be right back. Subscribe to Search TV on YouTube. Search for Search TV and click the subscribe button. If you're just joining us, this is the profile on Search FM 92.3, where we get to take a look at the world uh, through the eyes and ears of, you know, highly experienced individuals. And today we, I have with me here at the MBB house, Comrade Labarangarba, uh, who has been a teacher and a trade unionist for uh, over 40 years now. And we have had a very interesting conversation so far. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us, Comrade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is no way... Um, to talk about NUT and well without the name Comrade Labarangarawa coming up. So let's talk a bit about that journey. Well, um, it's an interesting legacy I always appreciate living behind in NUT. Because um, Endwell, NUT Endwell, 
uh, is my own child, which I I I initiated the idea of Endwell scheme. Uh, then through my late former chairman, Comrade Saleh Ibrahim, what inspired me to come up with this scheme is that I come to notice that when teachers retired, you see clearly written on their faces frustrations and worries because of the poor take home retirements. You discovered a teacher became a potential beggar. Then I look at the number we have as teachers at both primary and secondary school. I said, why can't we use our, the advantage of our numerical strengths to get things for our own, I mean on our own, that to at least reduce this exposure of being seen as a helpless species in the society, then the idea of Endwell came into being. It is a social security scheme, which we now call it Endwell. Then the idea is, if you retire as a teacher, before government call on you and say, come and collect your pension, come and collect your gratuity, you will fall back on what you have saved from, all, from your own legitimate earnings. Then the idea came up. So we met at the Executive Council of the Union. We sold the idea and it was bought. But before then, we had to sensitize teachers on this end wall of 18 for two good years using different approaches, cartoons, sensitizations, meetings, and what have you. Because the belief is that maybe this is, is, is a trick for the union leaders to just come and collect our money and go. But as God will have it, God the Almighty judge leaders from the old intention they have. And God happened to bless our intention then. Then we now decided to come up with this uh, project. And one thing we thought of is how do we secure the end world, because we can't remain there permanently, permanently. How do we secure the funds of these teachers? Then the idea of coming up with the Board of Trustees came up. Then we said, okay, in Board of Trustees, we must try to identify people with track records, people that once we mention their name, they will be accepted by the teachers and by the society. And that is how we come about the composition of the Board of Trustees from the government side, from the retirees, then we now happen to identify one Hajja Dijaj Brimbala MNI FRI to be the chairperson of this end well. And as God will have it, we involve the government organs as well, the head of our service office, the primary school, uh, so, uh, the suburb, uh, the suburb, the secondary school education board, Ministry of Education, all those that have Relevance, contributions, stakeholders, we involved them to form part and parcel of the workforce. That's how we started, with deducting 300 naira monthly by way of saving for these teachers. And as God will, go, and as God will have it, the program was blessed, and we keep on moving. There was sanity, there was appreciation, people have been seeing it. So from the original objective of keeping money for you before you retire, we now diversify. We begin to think of assorted materials we give to teachers, building materials, domestic uh, materials that we need maybe, build a, a, a motorbike, a lot of things. That is how we started. We happen to be to the best of our ability, prudent in the way our money, we collect this money. And today, before you know it, we're able to put up the first microfinance bank in the state for teachers, for a working class, which I will say the first even in the country because we're able to manage the bank from 2012 to date. And today in Niger State, if you're assessing microfinance bank, if that bank is not first, it will become second. This bank, the real owners, shareholders of the bank are purely teachers. We move also to build a modern school, a new model science school. By the money of these people subscribing as members of Endwell, we also move 
to also have some uh, 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 estates, have some in Soleja, in Menehia, all owned by teachers subscribing. So these are some of the places we plug this money they are contributing. Apart from what we are saving in the bank for them, once you retire, we now pay you what we have, what we, what we have saved along with the little percentage of what you have contributed, what you have contributed. Even if for nothing, we have assisted the teacher in instilling in him the discipline of savings. At least ordinarily, he would have he may, he may find it difficult to say, okay, I'm saving one or two things. And we make ourselves, we the practitioners, we the people handling it, also automatic member of such programs. Today, I'm happy I have retired and I have left behind this project. And I have left behind this legacy. And I also benefited from this end work because that was the first money I collected before even the NUT pay me part of my engagement. So many teachers, I believe, when you see them, you ask them who are beneficiary of that are beneficiary with this, they will attest to you the kind of benefit they have enjoyed from this end work. So today, if you are a leader, think of what to do to at least reduce the economic social hardship of your followers. And I think that I'm proud to have been associated with this end well of a team. We have done it, we have left it behind, and we continue to pray vehemently for the leaders we left behind to do or improve far much better from where we stop. And happily enough, let me also say that while I was there, I was able to champion the coaching and training of other unions to key into this kind of program. I remember the Nigerian midwife and nurses have also keyed in. The medical and health workers union have also keyed in. The Nigerian local government employees have also keyed in. And I have at least trained almost nine different states that came when I was in office, and I trained them how to go about to establish their similar end -well. So today, I'm happy we have... I have retired from the service and I was able to make my impact of social economic development for the members I provided the leadership of the services. And it is my prayer that these legacies we have left behind will not be bastardized, but instead will be improved far much better than people, I mean, for people that we have left there. And we, so long we are alive, we'll be very much ready and available to advise for the purpose of making this thing grow from strength to strength. That is the issue of Endwell, and I think that is my baby that I will continue to appreciate today. I visit the grave, I say yes. People, I believe, will continue to pray for the people that initiated it. So I pray Almighty Allah should assist those we left behind to continue to champion the cause of this kind of social security scheme program for our teachers, and also to encourage other unions that have not started to do the same particularly at this point in time, where workers need it, now that we're in very serious hush. Okay, so we've talked about Endwell, which you were, a, I mean, you just called Endwell your baby. Let's talk about, you know, another achievement, because it's almost like with you, we're moving from one achievement to the other one. You served um, on the state level, on the regional level, and on the national level with the Cooperative Federation of Nigeria. So... What is the story behind that as well? Well, I think I must admit, admit here that the, my, my gateway to cooperative movement is the Endwell program. Because I remember in 2017, I presented a paper in Japan uh, under ILO. So the ILO were surprised at how can a trade union su succeed in providing leadership, of, with a, 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 in providing cooperative leadership. So I told them the trick. So that opened the horizon of my being seen as a star in social security programs, that is Endwell as well. So uh, we started the Endwell here, I mean the cooperative here. The Department of Cooperative appointed me as a caretaker president of cooperative, not just a cooperative federation, after which uh, they feel I should contest for the president, which I did. Then at the national level, I was attending the national meeting of cooperative. Eventually, I was elected as vice president of the national cooperative of the of Nigerian Cooperative Federation, uh, that is CFN. 
And at uh, the same time, there was this change of policy or programs. Then I had to become also the chairman of the North Central of the cooperatives. So you see, when you look at Nigeria, as you holistically, you discover that cooperative movement is more on advantage or is more on a stronger base at the southern part of the country than here, here, we, here, than here in the north. So we keep on encouraging members. And before you know it, we go around sharing our experiences among others, among other cooperators. And today I'm happy to tell you that uh, in Niger State, we're still on our feet to make sure that uh, cooperative come back to its own real footing because we have so many uh, adulterators, I call them, that will just go and register cooperative society for maybe selfish end, put list of people that have not, maybe that are not even real members of the cooperative. But the fact here is that any government that wants to succeed to touch the minds and hearts of the downtrodden masses, the best channel for the government to apply or to use is the cooperative movement. When you introduce a cooperative movement, you discover that even an ordinary, a, a, a peasant farmer around, right inside the village will, 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 will benefit from the, common, from the government packages. So it is on this one I like to appeal to the government to identify uh, genuine registered cooperatives. They, they, when, they, when they identified most of the program and programs in, that has to do with empowerment, I think can successfully go through these organs. And I'm sure the changes will be seen glaringly. So the effects of the government uh, uh, packages will not be only left on one strata. It will go to spread over those down trading. But my appeal also to the cooperative leaders is that for any cooperative to succeed, they must have a leader that is prudent, a leader that is transparent, a leader that is God-fearing. Because when you look at the cooperative money, you feel, oh, is this just a money I can dump into it and eat? No. Once you have this attribute as a cooperative leader, as a cooperative leader, I'm telling you, <laughs> the sky will be your limit. Because you're going to enjoy a kind of dual advantage of prayers and blessing. The person you assist in making him something, he will pray for you, his children will pray for you, his grandchildren will pray for you, and you'll be there seeing that, yes, you are moving. So people will be wondering, this man used to maybe make consultation with some babalawos or some uh, this kind uh, all of those people. No, it is the performance you are doing that makes you this. So I think that is a little about the cooperative, and uh, I pray that uh, so long, since cooperative have not any terminal points, so long you're alive, even from your house, you can organize cooperative. In the market, you can organize cooperative. It's just a matter of saying that, yes, I have the clear and sincere mind to do it. So I like to urge governments to please come in and assist the cooperative movement for them to be streamlined and to be supported and to be empowered to make sure that, yes, there's a very sound and good service delivery to the people by the cooperative leaders. And that is my little journey to cooperative. Thank you, comrade. Now, um, over the years in defense fairs, you've been a leader. What would you say your leadership style is? Well, um, you see, the, the, the writers, or I call them philosophers, have defined leaders with different kind of styles. One thing I keep on saying is that leadership is one, but the size varies. The leadership style you see in the various textbooks and encyclopedia, democratic leader, social leader, all these things, they are all like that. The different styles of leadership has to be combined for you to succeed on what you want. One, you don't have to be a laser fear. You don't have to be too autocratic. You don't have to be a sort of autocratic, but my own kind of leadership is that I use combination forces of style of leadership to achieve what I want. Because as you are providing leadership, to some extent you have to be, have to be autocratic because 
the environment will decide for you when to be autocratic and when to be laser fair and when to be more simple. So the the the, the situation will dis, will decide that for you. So it's not good for, for for a leader to be too autocratic or to be too laser fair or be to be too I don't care about it. No, you have to combine these ties and achieve what you want to achieve because human beings are difficult to handle. Leadership is the most serious business of responsibility that you find difficulty in it. There is no way you become total perfect in what you are doing. While you are doing this way, others are doing, seeing you maybe doing the wrong thing. And that is why I said, I combine the styles to achieve what I want. In fact, the environment determines to me the style I will apply for me to succeed on what I want to succeed. Okay, uh, that's uh, very helpful. So let, let's move down to, you know, more of your personal life now, uh, work-life balance. You are always working. You have always been working. So have you been able to balance that with family and your children? And, you know, how did your family journey start as well, your journey as a family man? Well, you see, uh, that's a different aspect of life entirely because when you become, once you become a family man, you see, you will now see the clear definition of what the life is all about. But if you're a young guy, you're just out of school, you're working as a bachelor, you yet to get the real definition of what life is about until you begin to have responsibilities under you. Uh, from a teacher, when I was in the classroom, I know a day will come that I will leave that job. And a day will come that I will become a father, maybe a grandfather. So I began to plan, plan my life right when I was in the classroom. One is that I don't believe depending on salary income alone. I believe after closing, I should have something doing. I engage myself in buying and selling then because I started as a classroom teacher with a monthly salary of less than 100 naira as a grade two refer teacher. So, but then, there hardly a month will come and end without you see me with 20 or 30 naira in my pocket because I developed this idea of financial discipline. So I move. As, as I'm growing, as I'm growing, I get, I become a family man. I'm a kind of person that I don't believe in going to beg or in knocking your door every day, give me this, give me that. I believe that so long give God keep me healthy, I should be able to think of what to do to rely on myself and do something on my own. Because that, I believe, earns me a lot of respect. So I engage in petite trading, then buy this sell. As I'm growing in family size, then I went by, I get into farming. I cannot remember when last I bought either maize or rice or yam from the market. I farm it, despite the fact I'm doing this union job, I'm doing that job, but I, have, I make sure that once the rainy season comes, I move to the farm. Then I develop a business because one thing that struck my mind is when I was a labor leader, I was mingling in the mix of the governors, the commissioners, and the pump sex. And I believe one day I will not be there. Then how do I maintain my own social status? Is by making sure that I have source of dependency within myself, and that is farming. So I am being a farmer. I'm doing for the past 22 years, I've been farming. Poultry, now crop production, I have livestock, I depend on all time doing And that is why I call a spade a spade wherever I find myself. Because I know from there, since I can feel on my own and assist people assist me to maybe do one or two things, I feel what what stopped me from saying the truth? I must tell you the truth, and that's all. Because one day I'm just a stranger on earth, I will leave. And when I leave, I think I tell my children will be happy that yes. Daddy follow I have has trained us. And it may interest the public to know that most all my children now have already taken suit in farming. The, for my, the manager of my farm is my own child who has master's degree about running his page now. He read agriculture, is there his brothers are also running in the farm, so they're all more business. So I'm not saying that they're not going to do they're not going to do government work. They will do. But the kind of background, the kind of coaching you give to your family, I think uh, is something to be reckoned with. And that is what I've been doing. And I think I'm ever ready also to share that I share my experience always with the people that matters. Absolutely, comrade. So you have a lot of achievements. 
um which one would you say if you had to pick one as your biggest achievement one thing that you're most proud of that you did you've done in your career what would that be well in my career as a trade unionist is uh, the end well projects which i'm proud of because uh uh, I was able to provide leadership of over 34,000 teachers who are key into this program. And secondly, the second thing I'm proud of is my vocation, the farming business I've instated and now I've introduced my family to. I think these are two things I continue to live. And when I remember them, I remain happy with myself. So on the flip side, do you have any um, disappointments, anything that, you know, if you could go back in time to change, is there anything like that for you? you no, know, certainly. You see, life is, is, is a mix of uh, happiness and disappointments. And uh, certainly you cannot get all you want in life. Uh, one thing I, I always remember, I said, no, God, God, God has made the choice for me. In my life... After my second school career, I wanted to remain, I become an army. So when I think over it, why not in the army? Why not? Because that is the feel, that is the feel I fly, I feel, that is the place I feel I can go and fight for justice. But I think God has made the right choice for me. But when I look, most of my juniors now have retired in the military. Uh, those that joined it have already retired. I say God has made a choice, but that's only regret when I was then a youth. I feel I shouldn't have, should have been a military officer, but I think... That has all taken by events. Okay, so if you have one thing, one thing, say in 30 seconds, that you could advise the listeners, both young people who are just about to start their lives and people who are going through life now because you have a lot of experience, what would that advise me? Well, my advice for people is that, but particularly the young ones, I, 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 I vehemently advise that they should please try to do the right thing at the right way and uh, for the right uh, purpose. They must do the right thing at the right way for the right purpose. They will show, they should show away all this way of trying to get rich quick. That is just temporary. But once they do it rightfully, I'm sure God Almighty will dare to always support them. That is my brief advice I'll give to the youths of today. So one last question comes in. Um, you've spent your entire life on one side of the table as a trade unionist. Um, on the other side of the table, there is politics. Do you have any ambition, without any mention of any partisan uh, affiliations now, do you have any ambition in the political arena? Well, in the past, I don't, but now I have developed it because I realize that you can only chip in and make the difference when you are already in the system. Uh... I think now that I've retired and I'm still agile and still strong, is the right, this is the right time for me now to make my contribution to the politics so that we can now change the narrative when we're there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And we're looking forward to seeing what moves you're going to make. Uh, if there's one thing that, uh, you know, I can say that listeners should carry away absolutely from what you said is, you know, doing the right thing, at the right time. In the right way. The right way. For the right purpose. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today, Comrade Labranga. It's a pleasure. It's, it's, a pleasure. It's, it's been a very enlightening uh, session right here Thank at the MBB much. House. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. And that was the profile with Comrade Labranga. It's been uh, a very enlightening session here. And if you know anyone or if you would like to be um, on the profile, uh, you can always reach out to us on our socials, uh, search media, FUTMINA, and we'll go on from there. Have a great weekend. And until next time, my name is Udaba Koji, and for now, it's goodbye. This is Search FM.